to the edge. Everything bass fishing. Coming to you worldwide from MegaWin Kill Guard Studios. Oh, here we are back for the late February edition of Bass Edge Radio. Man, it's so gra- great to return to the studio. Man, since we last saw one another, uh, the M- MLF Invitationals kicked off at Sam Rayburn. There was a uh, MLF Toyota Series at Gunnersville. Bass Opens EQ stop number two over in Arkansas on Lake Ouachita. And uh, man, as we tape right now, kicking off is the first Bassmaster Elite Series of the Year on Toledo Bend. That should be a very exciting event. I'm sure everyone's going to be tuning into that and uh, watching that go down for the next four days. But also, right now, in progress, MLF stop number two on the Bass Pro Tour over there at Santee Cooper. Fishing seems to be a little tougher over there, but uh, still an exciting event nonetheless. Uh, If you're not a forward-facing sonar experience, you know, fan, you might want to check into Santee Cooper. Not a whole lot of that going on uh, over there. And of course, right now, Sam Rayburn, again, another event on Rayburn. The Toyota Series is going on right now. That's going to conclude on Saturday, right about when this episode of Bass Edge Radio goes live. So, uh, man, still busy, busy time of year. As always, the spring kicks off all the tournament trails. And, uh, man, I'm excited about this episode too. We're going to wrap up some of those tournaments we just talked about and kind of recap them a little bit. But uh, we also have a showcase segment back. Our first showcase segment in 2024. You're not going to want to miss this. We're going to talk about some European lures from a company called Digital Squad Fishing. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to go global right here on Bass Edge. We're going to bring in a gentleman from France, and uh, he's going to tell us more about those baits and how you can get them here in the United States. I'm going to give you a sneak peek, too, because I already got a few of them. They're pretty cool. Man, um, obviously, you never want to miss another episode of Bass Edge Radio. Make sure you hit that YouTube subscribe button. Uh, hit like, share, join the conversation in the comments below. Love to hear from all the Bass Edge listeners out there. Obviously, a shout-out necessary to Megaware Keel Guard. Keel guards providing your boat for protection from grinding salt, abrasive rocks, and concrete boat ramps. Don't be without MegaWare Keel Guard on your vessel. Proud partner of Bass Edge Radio. All right, we're going to run through um, what kind of my take on the events that uh, completed since our last episode. Um, we're going to bring back L- Rich Lindgren. I know uh, Hella Bass was a, a big part of the last show, breaking down tournaments. And uh, we're going to bring him in for that first Elite Series breakdown once it completes over the next several days on Toledo Bend. We're also going to bring Rich in to uh, talk on the next episode about that Santee Cooper MLF Bass Pro Tour that's currently going on. But breaking down the MLF Invitational, that obviously has already completed late, uh, about a week and a half ago, Drew Gill. He, the winner of that event, is going to be our feature angler in this episode. Man, he took the crown over there at Sam Rayburn Invitational after a great finish at the BBT MLF. Drew's a Bass Pro Tour angler. He's also some fishing some Invitational events. He's also fishing some Toyota events. Drew is basically fishing everywhere. And, uh, man, the youngest angler to ever win an MLF Invitational over there at Sam Rayburn Reservoir. Um, Took the crown over a previous Bass Edge guest, Toyota Series winner, Jake Lawrence. If you haven't listened to Jake's episode, go back uh, about a year ago from now. It was, I guess, about nine months ago. Jake and I had a great talk here on Bass Edge Radio about catching smallmouth bass spawning on forward-facing sonar. Obviously, Jake utilized forward-facing sonar to 
finished second place over there at Sam Rayburn. But, uh, man, big bags, big fish. That was what Rayburn was all about. Uh, Drew was was surprised he won. There was almost a 40-pound sack weighed in on day two. Drew thought he was fishing for second. But, uh, man, he he clinched the victory over there. And, and of course, it showed out. I do have to give a, a uh, quick recognition to Cal Lane catching most of his fish in that tournament on a 10XD. So that was great to see. Nick LeBrun fishing shallow inside grass lines, lipless crankbait, chatterbait was was his big thing, and also Ramey Colson Jr., old schooler, good time. Ramey Colson, he uh he's been around a long time, and uh, he also hit a top ten with the uh, chatterbug. So that uh, vibrating jig always does really well in the springtime, especially on grass fisheries. The Toyota Series event at Gunnersville kicked out more big weights. Man, that place was showing out too. Huge field out there. 260 anglers for that Toyota Series. Uh, traps and A-Rig. Predominant players in the top 10. But Scopin took the win. <laughs> That's right. Uh, the event was won by Auburn University student Hayden Marbot. And, and uh, Hayden utilized as i mentioned forward facing sonar jig head minnows to uh i, I think there's going to be a new tackle shop that's going to open up it's just going to be jig head minnow tackle shop that's what it's going to be it's it's uh, it's amazing how effective that is but uh congrats to hayden on on the big w there for the toyota series over at gunnersville how about that a college student winning just tens of thousands of dollars man that's got to be pretty awesome I, you, you got to watch these young kids that under 30 crowd is just blowing it up in all these terms drew gill uh i think he's 21 22 years old the under 30 crowd is really just doing a lot in the professional bass fishing world based on new technology but also having an open mind i think that's really critical when you're going out there and hitting the lake Utilize the new technology when you can, but always important to have an open mind. I feel like that's a continuous thing that you're seeing these young anglers be so successful with. Just um, they they don't have the preconceived notions that a lot of anglers have that have been to these lakes multiple times over and over, and uh, it's it's really helping them finish well in these events. Uh, shout out to Jordan Wiggins who did really well at the Sam Rayburn Invitational, and Drew Gill, the winner at the MLF Sam Rayburn Invitational, they both scuttled over to Lake Gunnersville with a very limited practice. Jordan finished fifth place. Drew Gill finished 11th. So uh, great to see those guys being able to back up solid finishes in, in uh, one circuit and then doing it again in another without a whole lot of practice. I'm in the... Uh, Next event, we, we discussed the Bass Open, EQ stop number two in the Bassmaster Open Series, Lake Ouachita, uh, Jeremiah Kendi, former FLW Tour Pro from right there in Benton, Arkansas, absolute local hammer on Ouachita. Um, man, he cranked up 52 pounds. Now, this lake put out a lot more than most people thought it was going to do. Zach Grutemann, an angler from New York, he caught an 11-pounder in the event. There was also another 10-pounder caught in the event, and 52 pounds over three days for a watch tall. Just freaking phenomenal. And the event was won throwing a little deep end crankbait and also a lipless crankbait, primarily over rock and grass over there at Lake Wachita. So um, the... Um, the overall consensus was big weights. It was impressive for that fishery, and it was a very, very good event. So great to see all that. Man, I uh, want to say one last thing. We had Tucker Smith on the last episode. He was leading the EQ points after event number one. Now he is about fifth place, but his roommate now is leading the Bassmaster EQ points, uh, he talked about Paul in the last episode, so congratulations to him leading the EQs after event number two. Man, you don't want to miss an episode of Bass Edge Radio. Again, be sure to subscribe on YouTube, hit that like button, join us in the comments below, catch 
every episode either on your favorite audio stream, iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, basically any of your favorite streaming platforms, and obviously, as mentioned before, on the YouTube station. So, man, I got to say, uh, I'm excited for this uh, next little, little deal right here. We've got the um, Digital Squad Fishing Showcase segment coming up. We're going to have a special guest. Y'all stay tuned. We got more Bass Edge Radio, feature angler later on, Drew Gill. Man, you're not going to win to miss this entire episode. Stay with us right here on Bass Edge Radio. We'll be right back. You know the importance of protecting your investments, so choose the protection the pros pick. Grinding sand, abrasive rocks, and concrete ramps are no match for our patented technology. The MegaWare Keel Guard is made tough and made to stick. Install it yourself in less than an hour, providing the most dependable, most trusted protection for your boat, guaranteed for life. Insist on the original Keel Guard the pros have picked for 25 years. MegaWare Keel Guard. <laughs> Since 1971, Basscap Boats has innovated, persistently thinking outside the box, never abandoning their roots or the commitment to quality through their process. Clearly visible in the new Puma STS, their design and development continues to evolve, improving performance, enhancing the angler's experience, and broadening the appeal of the sport they have dedicated their lives to. Basscap Boats, feel the rush. Here we are back from a quick break. We got it going on. We got a showcase segment. Man, you are going to be interested to hear this. You got to stay with us. Renaud Diaz, Renaud from yes. France. How yes. are you doing? How what what is the weather like in France on February, late February? <laughs> oh, it's horrible. <laughs> it's horrible. <laughs> it's horrible. It's raining and windy. I just heard my gate being slammed by the wind. It's, it's, oh, I'm wow. Well, what, well, man, welcome to Bass Edge Radio. man. Like I mentioned before the break, we're going to jump into our first showcase segment of 2024. Man, I was able to get my hands on a few of these lures. Digital squad fishing. Man, track them, tracked it down. The person behind the, the baits and, and a part of this program, Digital Squad Fishing in France. Man, again, welcome to the show, and thanks for joining us on Bass Edge Radio. Well, thank you very much for uh, having me on. It's a, it's a privilege and a pleasure to, um, to have this moment to present this bait. Um, yeah, I'm really looking forward. Absolutely. Renaud, these are some great looking lures. I've got uh, I got a few right here. I'm just going to just going to flash one or two, man. The color is awesome. Uh, we're we're going to show some more of these baits coming up. But tell us how Digital Squad got its start. And and is there good bass fishing in France? Yes, actually, you would be surprised. It's a lot similar to uh, what you'll find in the United States in that in the southern half of the country, we have a decent and growing bass population, but over here I'm on in the northern. I'm in Normandy, okay. and uh, we have more of a multi-species uh, kind of fisheries around around here. With some bass here and there, but not not as good. So multi-species. These would be pike, pickerel. Yes. Uh, do you have walleye? What what kind of species are you talking about other than the bass that you have there in France? So yes, yeah, pike and walleye that we call it sander over here. It's it's a okay. It's slightly different fish, but very, very similar fish the same way. Trout, okay. of course, um, and um, yes, yeah, so and that's that's the that's the main fish. Yeah, very cool. Very. What's a, what's a big bass in in France? Oh yeah, they're not they're not big bass. They're not, they're not as big. Plus, we weigh we weigh them in kilos, you know, so it doesn't right. sound as as impressive. <laughs> You think about a five, six pounder would be a giant there? Or, yes, or? yes, yeah, okay. exactly. We, five or I've, six pounder. I, I have, I've never caught um, fish this big in France, but I hear of three kilos being caught Very maybe nice. once a year. Very nice. Yeah. That, that's that's a big fish by by any anglers. <laughs> yes. By any anglers catch. So very, very great to hear. Um, man, let's talk about some of the key design elements again this is digital squad fishing this this was born in europe right this brand was born in europe um yes. you know t tell us a little bit about 
you know, how Digital Squad got to start. Yes. So the, um, these baits were designed by a, a very passionate angler. His name is Romain Grimaldi. He designed this bait. He has a, an eye for uh, for uh, for designing, for for drawing. Um, and then as a team, we developed the uh, swimming action and, and and the colors and and all the elements. They were uh, each bait was designed for a specific mission. So of okay. course the, the key is of course to catch fish and and, and to be uh, effective. But each one has a one special feature that you will not find uh, somewhere else. For example, one of our best seller uh, here in Europe is the Tyrant 100. So it's wow. 100 millimeter. It's it's not very long, but it's very big and very heavy. It's a weight bait, as as it could obviously be uh, seen. It moves a lot of water, very noisy, very obnoxious. It's meant to be retrieved slowly over grass beds in uh, late evening, in the morning. And it has something. It, it will draw. Um, it will draw attention of, of the bigger fish. It, I've I've seen uh, conditions where fishing was tough, and we were trying to finesse and try to find something. And out of desperation, you know, might as well be bored on the top water. That's what I always <laughs> say. You know, if you're not catching it, might as well be bored on the top water. At least you're seeing something. You have something going on. Absolutely. And I saw this bait, and boom, I connect with a bigger fish because it just it just has something. So you see this this design and look and. Uh, this uh, it has BKK hooks, so it's not going to uh, bend or open or anything like that. Very sturdy, oversized uh, uh, eyelet as well. So, Very nice. Um, that yeah. looks like a great bait for a uh, West Coast side here in the U.S. Man, they love throwing those big swim baits. Not to say the East Coast doesn't too, but definitely kind of born in a tradition over there in the West Coast. So I can see a lot of West Coast anglers playing with that. Some of yes. these, some of the other baits that I saw. I, even even down to a little like BFS style. Uh, this right. is a little little jerk bait. Uh, so that's the exact opposite. If you want, that's a very finesse. So we notice that the way uh, a bait sinks is very important. We do a lot of vertical fishing under the sonar here. Yeah, and I noticed that you have many more bites as the bait is falling. This is a very key moment in in a cast in a retrieve in a, in a uh, um, session, if you want, or, or, or a process of, uh, of making a cast. Sure. And this one has been designed to be very active as it sink. So it has a very, I can't, I can't really do it with my finger, because it's really fast and it will, and it will flash as it sinks fairly, fairly quickly. Nice. But then the retrieve is very moderate. There's, okay. there's no wiggle or nothing like that. It just, it just make S very, very moderate. What's what's some of the you know there there's a, a string of plastics too. Uh, got my hands on this uh, Rizal shad. Very nice looking plastic. Very yes. interesting how how they've uh, gotten the colors uh, yes. mixed into the bodies of the bait. Yes. Um, tell us a little bit about that process and and what other styles of baits or or some of the. Uh, best selling styles of baits that yes. digital squad provides so we have two uh very complementary swim bait the one you show has a very heavy tail it mm -hmm. it doesn't look it doesn't act like its competitors it, it has a very wide and very slow kicking action so it's yeah. perfect behind a chatter bait or just as a cast and retrieve just throw it out there on a jig head or on a a uh, weighted um, beast hook or something like that, and just just throw it and retrieve it. No, well, it's can... not great as it's sinking. Nothing, nothing like that. This Look on the other hand, is... Look how supple that tail is right there. It's got to create just tons of action through the water. You know, yes. a stiff a stiff swim bait that would sit up here like this isn't going to create a lot of action. But when you get a swim bait that's that's hanging over this far. You know that that has a lot of flexibility to it, and it's going to exactly. create tons of action in the water. So yes. Very cool. Very cool bait. Very moving. And on the other spectrum, if you want, this is the exact opposite. This one has uh, it's a dull shad. It has a – I'll put it in front of – it has a very natural shape. Mm -hmm. And on this one, the tail um, is very light. So this one is, is going to be perfect for um, either vertically under the boat or on the FFS sonar type, absolutely, because you can yeah. you you want to weight it as little as you can, and and just let it do its thing. 
this is not a cast and retrieve. This is a very, uh, um, it's a sniper lure. It's for right, presenting right. It in front of the fish. Even if you don't retrieve it, just the boat um, uh, draft or, or, or um, uh, just the angle of the line, it's, it's going to be moving probably not much. It's not going to go and, and go all crazy. This is, this right, is a very right. tight, very natural with a, with a profile that is very natural. And it comes That's in two good. sizes. It's a 5.3 inches. And we have the four. I don't have it here. I've got the four uh, inches also for a more finesse, clear water. This is great for maybe a little bit of a more of a muddy yeah. uh, stain or overcast day like, like it is now. Uh, and on clear days, we have the four inch. So, uh, how many models of baits are 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 digital? Is Digital Squad selling? Uh, give us give us some ideas of how big the line is. Obviously, you can't show us every bait. I mean, I have a small yeah. selection of things here, but but um, how many models of of Digital Squad lures are there out there? Uh, I believe, not counting the variation in size, we have about fifteen models. Okay, so a nice assortment. Uh yeah. Yes, they usually come in in five or six colors. That's the uh, that's the standard. Doesn't doesn't apply to uh, to every um, every bait, but uh, right. but yes, that's that's about it. Very cool. So, how can anglers find these lures? Um, I, I know that you've been working to uh, progress sales and and make them available here in the United States. Where where can U.S. anglers find these unique baits that have I mean, I would consider just fantastic finishes, very unique plastic uh, colorings and, and things like that. Where can they find this stuff? Um, so we've just opened a store on Amazon. And uh, you can find the, the entire lineup that we have available in the United States on our Amazon uh, store. Uh, I think if you just uh, look for Digital Squad Fishing, you'll find it. Or through the through uh, the website that I've just opened uh, with the, imp the 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 company importing is Providence Angler. So okay. if you go on Google and search for Providence Angler, you will find and you have a way to shop, a way to go uh, tab, and uh, and I'll give you and I'll give you the uh, direct Amazon link at a couple store that will uh, be stocking our bases throughout this spring. So a couple stores starting to, okay, what, what we'll do, I'll, I'll get that, uh, those link information from you. We'll put it down here in the description. So, you know, make sure everybody can check down in the description there on the YouTube. We'll, we'll put a link to the Amazon store for Renault and also put a link into the uh, Providence Angler. Is, is yes. that, that, that's the company that's distributing the baits yes. here. Is that correct? Yes, that, okay. that's exactly right. Very yes. cool. Very cool. Yes. All right, Renault, man, this has been super exciting. A great sharing this information with the uh, Bass Edge Nation, man. I'll give you a quick chance for any closing thoughts while we wrap up this first showcase segment in Bass Edge for 2024. Yes. Thank you very much for uh, having me on. It's a pleasure. I want to Give a big shout out to uh, everyone out there. I'm, um, I love the United States. I've traveled there many times. I stayed for uh, several years in the great state of Oklahoma. So special nice. shout out to, uh, to um, all your uh, people listening from Oklahoma. Um, I love Texas too and Arizona and, and many, many other places. Uh, you have a great country, a really, really great people. have been very welcoming for me every time I've traveled there. I love you guys and, uh, and thank you for having me on. Absolutely fantastic. Well, it was great to have you on as well, Renault. And uh, we'll, we'll see if we can't get some of these baits in some of these U.S. angler hands. I think this is a neat product. We'll, we'll definitely be working on that. All right, y'all stay tuned. It's time for the Feature Angler Spotlight with Drew Gill. Sam Rayburn, Invitational Championship, coming up. Plenty of sunshine. Come on, man, let's roll. What the? To catch the fish, you need to be one with the fish. With PowerPole shallow water anchors, you'll get the ultimate in precision, power, and control so you can catch more fish. No face paint or phony fins necessary. 
Excessive shock and vibration are two leading causes for premature battery failure. Prolong the life of your batteries with the new MegaWare Battery Guard. The Battery Guard sits under your battery and absorbs excessive vibration and bounce, reducing G-Shock by up to 80%. Great for boats or anywhere shock and vibration can damage a battery. The Battery Guard can easily be trimmed to fit virtually any custom shape or battery size. Save money by protecting your batteries. Spend more time on the water and less on maintenance. Find yours at MegaWare.com. All right, here we are back with it. I want to remember and remind everybody this feature angler spotlight brought to you by Bass Cat Boats. That's right, feel the rush. Dude, feature angler spotlight. This guy has been everywhere the last couple weeks. There he is, Drew Gill. Drew, thank you for joining us here on Bass Edge Radio. I appreciate that, man. I'm just ready to talk fishing. You know, uh, this is this is my life. This is what I do nonstop. You know, we are here in uh what is it the the fourth week of february and uh I, i'm on my fourth tournament in that many weeks so uh it's, unbelievable. it's, it's, a, it's a pretty I, tight schedule but uh man it, if it's not if it's not going fishing it's talking fishing i, I love both equally as much very cool man well that's what we do here at bass edge radio so you'll fit right in uh i noticed you you ran and basically you, you had to run straight from sam rayburn to go fish the gunnersville toyota just mm-hmm. missed the top 10 there finished 11th yep. place still made the cut top 25 make the cut at those uh gunnersville events and, and finished uh, 11th i also saw um jordan wiggins brother uh made the top 10 as mm-hmm. well so both you guys uh lit it up over there just kind of uh getting over there on a short practice making things yep. happen and no uh, I mean, it's fun to watch that kind of stuff. If you kind of know what's going on and see the anglers and, and follow them through their progression of events, it's it's really cool. So I'll let all the listeners know you're at Santee Cooper right now. You're on the day's rest. You're in between competition days, right? No doubt, man. Um, you know, I am I am here at Santee. I just fin- I'm in Group B this week, so I, I finished up my uh, first day of the qualifying round yesterday, and uh, – in 23rd, you know, could have had a, a better yeah. day, but definitely could have been worse. You know, I, I survived. A lot worse. <laughs> uh, I, I survived. And really, that was my goal yesterday was to not get so far behind that it didn't matter, you know, what I did the second day. And, and I, I managed to stay in the middle of the pack. And we have a lot more agreeable conditions tomorrow. So, you know, whenever cool. you get an influx of a population on a lake like Santee, if you're, if you're good at dialing in how to catch them, you're going to have a better day than most. So. Man, they, they can flood the bank there for sure. I remember an Elite Series event there many, many years ago that uh, that that type of scenario happened with that warmer water trend after it had been cold. And, uh, mm-hmm. man, it can get crazy really, really quick on Santee Cooper. So good luck to you tomorrow as you tackle your second day of competition. Man, what's your impression so far about the BBT? Um, obviously, you're fishing with some wily veterans over there, much different than you were at the uh, invitational level last year, which you mm-hmm. dominated, essentially. Uh, that's how you qualified for the Bass Pro Tour. Um, how do you like it? Do you like the days off? How How's the uh, camaraderie? Um, I know you're only in your second event, so it might be hard to dive into that. But uh, what say you on on uh, fishing the Bass Pro Tour and um, in MLF in general? You're basically you look like you're all in on on the MLF platform. Yeah, man. So, I mean, the Bass Pro Tour format is unlike it's unlike any other tournament um, yeah. in bass fishing because of the length of the event, the zeroing of the weights, and right. the repeated cut scenario conjunction with the every fish counts and score tracker like yeah. mentally it's a it's a totally different challenge uh yeah. than than any other format in fishing and so it's been it's been a bit of an adjustment i was glad my first dose of that format was at toledo because toledo bend is the kind of fishery where really you don't have to worry about rationing fish you don't have to worry about fishing in a way that lends to either catching more or catching bigger because i was right. fishing the way that i was catching more and catching big ones in the process you know i caught four over six that week Catching big ones and lots of them all at once. Catching big ones and lots of fish. I mean, you you didn't have to think through that aspect of it. And it was the kind of place where really it was a, it was a winter tournament. It was not a spring tournament whatsoever. And, and in a winter tournament, the fact that from the start of practice, the end of the event is nine days separated does not really factor. Right. In the winter, in the winter, it doesn't factor. And so like at Toledo, it, you, you'll you know, go it, fish tomorrow. You, you're in 23rd right now. You're going to go mm-hmm. fish tomorrow. If you make the top 10, then you qualify for the knockout round, correct? 
uh, finished top uh, 10 for 20th. Oh, 20th place makes the knockout round? No, 10th makes the knockout round, but then okay. once we're in the knockout round, I mean, it doesn't matter and, that I had a terrible day yesterday if I just squeak through. Exactly. Weight zero, totally mm-hmm. different format like you mentioned. And as time progresses, fish move, fish change. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, the neat thing that I like about the Santee tournament that I've watched so far, uh, watching yesterday, today, uh, the day before yesterday, the first uh, day of the event, is uh, four-facing sonars a little bit out of the of the scenario. I'm not saying that guys aren't using it to catch fish, Mm -hmm. but it's not a predominant uh, functionality for, for anglers to target the bass this week. I mean, they're they're targeting them and seeing them on forward facing, but it's, it's not the jig head minnow sling it over out in front of the fish, you know, work it back to the fish and, and get a bite. You know, it's, it's, it's totally different. How do you like those style of events? I see anglers, Kuya Fujita for one, he fishes the elite series He's at Toledo Bend right now, big bag today. But you mm-hmm. see him on some of those shallow fisheries, seems to struggle a little bit. How do you compensate for the differences in the styles of fisheries based on uh, what your comfort level is in attacking the, the bodies of water? Yeah, man. So basically we're talking about uh, the approach that you have to the concept that is forward-facing sonar. Yes. So if you take the approach of, forward-facing sonar allows me to easily fish offshore in every tournament that's an approach that will lead to being a what I'll, I'll call a dominating force in offshore tournaments right but it makes you lacking in shallower events like like with the invitations last year events like you follow oklahoma lake of the ozarks lacrosse like we saw uh yeah. a lot of your stereotypical scopers that are offshore guys struggle exactly um, just, it's just about how you use it versus the way I choose to use it. It's an information collection device. If you sure view is. it for the lens of through the lens of this technology makes me more efficient in every way because it allows me to see my surroundings, understand the scenario and take into account the fish, the habitat and the forage around at all times. And really just gives me a look into what I'm dealing with. If you just view it purely from an information standpoint, right. it's always a benefit. And so like, but it changes how you use it. So like here at Santee this week, forward facing sonar when I'm offshore determines when and where I cast. Okay. It's not determining when and where I cast here at Santee. I'm fishing, I'm I'm fishing the points and islands of of cypress trees right now. I'm fishing, you know, lead in places to different bays and shallow areas. So those casts are already predetermined. I see a a cypress tree that has a, you know, a a good base of of knees spreading out from it or is on the corner of a whole field of cypress trees, that cast is already predetermined. I know I'm making that cast. Right. Forward-facing sonar just allows me to make sure that every opportunity I do get, I maximize. So, like, yesterday, for example, I'm making all these casts as if I didn't, wasn't using it. It just Mm. allowed me to see if there was a fish where I was throwing. And so I would pitch my bait up there. I'd, I'd fish it. And if there was one on it, I'd kill it. They'd go down and eat it. I had six opportunities at a bass yesterday. And hooked wow. all six of them. Wow. I put five in the boat, lost one. But I had, I, I know for a fact, because I watch every cast I made all day, that I had six opportunities. And I landed five of the six fish. You know, I hooked all yeah. of them, but but landed five, six. And, like, it's just a difference in approaches. And, I mean, there might be, I'm sure down in, down in Moultrie, probably where there's offshore grass and stuff, there's probably some people using it in a more traditional sense, more okay. formal sense. Really, I use it in every tournament all year, but it's not always in an extremely formal, I'm going offshore fishing with forward-facing sonar to go throw a jerk bait over bass and watch them come up and look at my bait right. scenario, it, where I'm just hunting single fish and throwing a bait over them. Like, gotcha. that's that's something that obviously plays at Toledo. It's going to play at Dale. It's going to play at the St. Lawrence River. But, but like, tell, you tell, tell us some things that, that conditionally – uh, equal that opportunity, right? Um, is it clarity of water, um, I, you know, current, um, the way that you are patterning the bass? I, I watched the uh, MLF Day 5, uh, which you broke down the San, Sam Rayburn win very well. And, you know, definitively you talked about a style of pocket where you saw most of the fish. It wasn't just which a lot of people <laughs> think plop the trolling motor down and start mm-hmm. fanning and looking, right? No. I mean, you – you had a specific deal going. Um, how how do you set that up for example, some of these other fish fisheries you you mentioned? Yeah, man, and that that really comes down to the one thing that we consistently got right and understood even before forward facing sonar and bass fishing. The one overarching broad thing that we got right that was really important to get right 
right. was understanding okay. <laughs> how bass use the environment they're in and the topography on a lake to move. Gotcha. We understood how – correct. We understood yeah. how river channels and creek channels and different basins versus flats manipulated the way bass moved in a rounded area. We gotcha. understood that really well. And if you don't understand how to use – you know, your resources via Google Earth and looking at just how a lake lays out in terms of creeks, pockets, you know, the directions that these areas are facing in relation to the time of year, plus right. your your ability to read your charts and Navionics and things like that. Sure. Like, that is that is the base foundation for understanding how to consistently find fish. LifeScope is an awesome tool for understanding what you're around, for maximizing opportunities. But this is the thing that I don't think people address often enough when they're thinking about how modern technology has changed bass fishing. Mm -hmm. You look at two pieces of modern technology. One is always focused on one is it, but you look at forward facing sonar or modern mapping. If you took away modern mapping and just gave somebody a blank slate of just a lake, it's just blue it's on their chart. Struggle up. Yeah. Weights would be worse with no modern mapping than they would be with no forward facing sonar. Yeah. That's a great point. Really, really good. Modern point. mapping has totally changed how we fish these fisheries because we can high percentage the crap out of it from home because we understand how bass use these these contours. We understand yes. how they use them certain times of year. And we can throw away 90% of the lake before we ever show up. Yeah, yeah. And so so basic understanding of bass behavior fundamentals, obviously critical to the success of of all fishing, not just for facing sonar, but you can't just go out there and think, oh well, I bought this, you know. Five thousand dollars worth of mm -hmm. equipment. I'm just going to drop the troller, start scanning around, yeah. see fish, and start casting and catching. Because I've seen this a lot, where I talk to anglers and they say, "Man, I'm seeing a fish here and there, but I never see my bait. I never know where the fish is going or what's happening." And I feel like just like you talk about the fundamentals of bass behavior, anglers need to find out and and understand and be adapt at the fundamentals of forward facing sonar, um, how to hit the cone 10 out of 10 times, how to hit the distance. What are those fundamentals that you felt like really led you to a, a next level um, from a mechanical standpoint? I mean, so when we're growing up learning these, these concepts of bass fishing, let's take this to a very rudimentary sense. When yeah. we're growing up learning how to, how to fish shallow cover, how are you going to become a better flipper or better at skipping docks? Right. You're going to flip a million bushes and you're going to skip a million docks. And, and you see guys like Andy Montgomery that have skipped 427 million, 420,405 <laughs> docks in their lifetime. And they're the best at it because of how many times they've repeated the process. So the same concept holds true with forward facing sonar. You yeah. can't expect to master anything without an insane amount of repetition. Yeah. And the other thing is in this, in this illustration, there's floating docks. There's there's post docks. There's the docks on the TVA that have the X bars. Like, like we talk about different kinds of docks. How you approach walkways versus the front of the dock. Like these are different scenarios in skipping a dock. These are different. Right. These are di essentially different skills in within the same skill. And like for forward facing sonar, the same thing is true. Learning how to catch them. Yes, offshore on main lake points and flats. Learning how to catch them on brush. Learning how to catch them suspended. Right. and learning how to catch them around the bank, you know, fishing down the bank, looking at a riprap bank or clumps of grass, you know, look, looking under docks, learning how to catch them out of flat drains in the backs of creeks, you know, throwing a trap yeah. or chatterbait or swim bait, uh, learning how to, <clears throat> how to approach fish on scope with a top water. Like these are right. all different little pieces Nuances, of the puzzle yeah. that, that you only get from spending an insane amount of time using this technology <laughs> and watching bass interact both with their environment and with your bait. And, uh, you know, it, that's that's one thing that people always misconstrue is they they go, oh, you know, we're spotlight and point and shoot. Just point at them, throw out there and reel them in. It's, it's if it was that simple, I can tell you this right now, 99.9% .9 of all professional tournament anglers have it on their boats. If it was that simple, weights would be extremely inconsistent. You know, some guys would do well in these events. Other guys would do well in these events. That's not what's happening. Yeah. You're seeing 10 to 12 guys in the sport right now that are dominating everyone, every event. Yes. That cannot happen without, A, the information to know the facts, and B, the ability to use those facts effectively in a systematic fashion every single turn. And Where that is that? the only way that you have 10 to 12 guys that dominate the entire field every event. It used to be just fishing. It's not anymore. 
Right, right. Very, very well said. Were, were you a lecturer sometime in your high school or college days? <laughs> because I feel like I'm asking some good questions, but man, the way you spit it back rudimentarily, like like you mentioned, is so good for the listeners. So, so much more to understand and and to get them from starting at you know the fifth step and and reeling them back in and getting them started mm-hmm. at step one. Really, really critical. Um, great, great stuff on that, man. On the um, basic differences, I want to talk a little bit the different subjects. Still forward facing sonar, mm-hmm. but understanding identifying fish. Uh, you hear a lot about that. Um, obviously, time, expertise, mm-hmm. hours on the water. Oh, I seen yep. that before. Oh, yeah, that is a bass. Uh, but even with the number of hours you have, I remember a clip at, at Rayburn. You caught one right under the boat. Uh, you mm-hmm. know, on a jig head minnow and. And and you were hoping it was a bass. You weren't sure. Yep. And 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 maybe that was just because you know you, you kind of figured it was. But um, tell us a little bit about how to identify like some basics, right? You don't have to get yeah wildly dipped, but but to give people a start of some ways to identify. Okay, that's most likely a bass. Okay, or a catfish or drum or whatever. Yeah. So in this, I'm going to mostly attack fishing in, you know, shallower than 20, 25 feet of water, which is where most of these trash fish interactions happen. If we're fishing super deep or way offshore, generally speaking, we're a bit more dialed and, and we're, we're fishing for a larger population of just, just bass. Yeah. So in this scenario, okay. we'll talk about fishing a little bit shallower, but, you know, you talk about the hardest ones to tell generally are, are catfish, walleye, bowfin, and drum. Those so are the like, hardest or easiest? Hardest to tell hardest. from bass generally because okay. of the way that they relate. So gotcha. basically, catfish and walleye specifically are the hardest of the four. Bowfin and drum, they'll they'll set up and kind of they're you know they'll they'll move in singles generally. Other than on the Great Lakes, drum are, are very solitary fish. Um, so you'll see a single fish swimming. You know, generally they're a bit suspended above the bottom. And they're generally of that same size range that you're looking for when you're looking for a, a three to six pounder um and generally they're in that size range right right so the easiest thing with drum you can see if you have your screen framed right you can see the size of their head and drum will ease up on a bait and just if you hang your bait still they will close all of that distance while your bait is not moving whatsoever rarely will bass do that Mm -hmm. generally speaking when you stop a bait a bass stops you know you go he stop go stop go stop one of the only exceptions to that is with a jerk bait or top water something that hangs above their head Okay. Then they'll then they're willing to close the distance, but if it gets below them ever and they still close distance, it's probably drum. Um, it, <clears throat> but with both in, I mean, both in are a rare scenario. You know, there's only a few s- situations where ever around right. that many both in, but both in generally you can tell that they swim a little bit uh, more snake like. Really, it's it's more of a slither. It's a fast slither, and uh, their movements are really snappy. It's like they'll go from no movement to hard slither to no movement. Bass don't do that. Bass, when they decide to move, they're going to be very steady, and they're either going to steadily increase in speed or just keep a keep a consistent rate. But they're going to be steady. Uh, they they move in one direction. They don't change direction a whole bunch. They they're going to be pretty consistent. Um, but which is why catfish and walleye are so hard to tell. Catfish generally set up in singles, just like semi-suspended or you know bigger largemouth in an area do you know when we're yeah. just talking about fish swimming away from a target obviously and i, re- I, I just say let me say this real quick i remember uh back when kentucky lake was really good which you're not far from kentucky lake uh but but man you know the ledge fishing was just phenomenal and you could go across an area and think they were bass on your on your um you know, your down scan and side scan and you wind through them things and your line would just be slime the whole way yep. through. It's yep. crazy on those scenarios that how, how similarly they look, but it sounds like they're, yep. they're very similar in forward facing as well. Yeah. Catfish. And the thing about catfish is they are willing to move very fast to chase and kill your bait. Just like a bass will when they come in, mm. they will do that. Not all the time, but they will do that. And they're often singles. Generally your catfish that are just swimming around are about that same size range, that three to six pound size range. They're not the giant catfish. Right. And this is talking about just fish swimming around. The easy way to tell is really bass or anything else is just two things. How it relates to cover. Does it relate to cover? Does it? And when it relates to cover, is it in the cover or is it around the cover? Hmm. Because bass are typically more around the cover. 
Okay. Catfish will get in the cover. Same thing with walleye. Walleye will get, like, you look at a rock pile that's got walleye in it up north when you're trying to tell smallmouth of walleye, right. and they will just get lined up, just stacked on the target. Whereas if you got a bunch of smallmouth on a rock pile, right. there will be a couple near the rocks, but then you'll see them kind of scattered out, just <laughs> like a constellation, just dotted up around it. Okay. Um, and then the other one, throw a bait in front of them. Throw a bait in front of them. Because bass, when they show attention to a bait, they'll come up, they'll be very steady. They are going to engage with your bait, and generally they're either going to engage with it, and as you move it, they'll keep getting closer, but you got to keep moving it for them to do that. Or they will follow it kind of on a string, so your bait will move, and they'll stay behind at a very consistent rate. Um, but bass have a very long attention span compared to most other fish. Like, they're, they are willing to chase something most of the time, outside of the winter. They're willing to chase it for a very long period of time keep attention even if they don't commit oh, okay. uh bass will always show your bait attention unless you've thrown at them like eight times with the same bait but like until you get to that point if it's your first throw at a fish and it doesn't show any attention to your bait and you know you hit it it's not a bass um okay. and really that's the easiest way to tell i mean oh, and I the catfish it. catfish are the same way as drum is like if you hang your bait still a catfish will close the distance that's Rarely when you people. just hang your bait in place will a bass close the distance. Generally, when you stop a bait, a bass will stop. Obviously, it, it, but, Go ahead. Yeah. And uh, another thing on, on the last note, too, and talking about forward-facing sonar and learning it, biggest thing I can tell people that are trying to, that have been not guys that are just getting into fishing now with forward-facing sonar, but guys that have been fishing for a long time, right. is fish the same way you always have once you put your forward-facing sonar on, but watch every cast. And you will be able to, instead of just foregoing everything you've learned and everything you've done for a long time, take what you've learned, what you've done for a long time and apply forward facing sonar to it to make you more efficient because you'll hit more casts to make you more effective at turning follows into bites and to allow you to quickly make adjustments. But like, don't throw it all away and just drive out in the middle of the lake, drop your trolling motor, and just start looking around. Like right. it's not a total, you're still bass fishing you're doing it in a much more efficient sense so the quickest way to learn it if you already have all the preconceived notions that we've built up from years of fishing yep. is to just fish the way you always have but watch for a, for a while i'm not saying for your yep. whole career of using live scope but for the first while you've got it just fish the way you always have but watch every cast you make and just see how they interact with your bait see what cover they're related to and over time you'll start to develop an understanding of why fish relate to what they relate to what you know when you used to pull up in a pocket back in the day in the fall and just kind of throw your trap around and randomly catch them. And you, you're kind of surmised because there's bait around you'd see on your 2d or whatever right. there. And then now we have live scope and you throw it out there and you realize, Oh crap, there's one literally blowing bait apart right in front of me. That's why you used to catch these fish. But like there were some days where the bait was there and there were just no bass. A lot of those days we were just getting back there and we just weren't hitting them. Right. And we didn't realize that, but it's a lot of the time, you know, I'm obviously there have been times where I fish a tournament like and found something so off the wall that it was something we would never do before. But like you look at a lot of my tournaments, you look at, you follow Oklahoma last year, fishing down transition rock banks, Lake of the Ozarks fishing for bedfish on scope or like lacrosse. I was fishing wing dams for the smallmouth, doing stuff that we've always done, but using forward facing sonar to make myself more efficient and turn more follows into bites. And that's, go. I think that's the biggest difference and thing people don't understand about forward facing sonar is like, they always assume forward-facing sonar equals different way of fishing. Right. Does not equal different way of fishing. It's an information tool. That is what it is. It is the ability to go from guessing to knowing. That's it. Very as good. As soon as you take it past that, we 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 had offshore fishing before we had forward-facing sonar, yes. and so once we got forward-facing sonar, we just slapped it on offshore fishing. <laughs> said, this is offshore fishing. Live scope is so beyond that. It is just a device that allows you to to know what you did to know exactly what happened all day. And that is the key to learning anything is information. If you have the details, you can learn and, and grow. I like it. All right. Um, I noticed in a photo, I think it was in the top 10 of, of the Rayburn deal. You, you hear a lot of different things. We saw Gussie win the classic on a Demiki rig uh, last year in Knoxville. Uh, he was very adamant about the 90 degree hook, the knot being just perfect on top of the hook being basically parallel with the <clears> way <throat> he was fishing it. I noticed your bait, you were using a loop knot in, in one of your jig head mm -hmm. minnows uh, presentations. Um, what, What's the advantage, disadvantage of each 
set up in that regard, like the actual loop knot versus tying it, you know, well, it's tied direct with a loop knot, but cinching it directly with the loop knot. And when do you go one versus the other? Yeah. So, I mean, really with that question, I think more often than not, just from playing around with both, I think more often than not, it's just personal preference. Okay. But the thing with the loop knot is I know just due to the science of the loop knot that every time I throw that bait out there and I start fishing it back, it's going to fall in that knot the exact same way every time because the knot is not binding on the eye. So I know that my, it's not necessarily about making the presentation do one thing or another. Okay. It's about making the presentation consistent. So okay. I know for a fact that that knot is never going to bind in the little pinch. Right. It's never going to pull forward. Like it's always going to hang in the exact same spot on the eye every single time I throw that bait, which means I know every, I, you know, it's just controlling variables. Sure. I want to know that that engagement that I just had with that fish was exactly the same as the presentation that I gave to the last fish I threw at to where if neither of them bite, I know it's the issue is, is either with the head of my, the weight of my bait, the profile of my bait, the color of my bait. I know it's an issue with that. And it's not that like my knots just getting in a bind and I'm getting skewed data because I have some sort of variable that's outside of, of my awareness and okay. I'm going and making adjustments uh, based on an assumption that I'm making that may or may not be true. And so I try to control all of the variables around what we call the experiment in this sense yeah, as yeah. much as possible. So but, that uh, loop knot's giving you a consistent variable mm -hmm. um, every time. So you know, well, um, I know my bait's working the same around these fish. Uh, I know mm -hmm. it's sitting in the saddle of that knot the same every time. And yep. uh, if they're not biting it, maybe I need to change baits. I need to change colors. I need to go bigger, smaller, uh, entirely yep. different presentation, whatever the scenario would be, which yes, you did on Sam Rayburn and yep. uh, through the Nico rig in, in the mix as, as kind of things started to change, I think throughout the week, right? The mm -hmm. fish started to become a little bit more bottom related. You saw they weren't uh, coming up or, or you weren't <laughs> able to get some of those fish to hit as well. And, and you changed it up to uh, solidify the big W. <laughs> yeah, man. So at Rayburn, I was watching these fish. They would come up and engage with my Demi rig. And in practice, they would come up, engage with it, eat it every time, every single time. Yeah. First day of the tournament, I was throwing it. And they would come up and engage with it. Some of them eat it, would eat it, but some of them wouldn't. But, like, if you go from them eating it every time or darn near every time to a, a visible difference in the, um, the number of bites to follows you're getting, something yeah. has changed. There has been a change. And that's an indicator that you might need to make an adjustment. So, like, I, I watched these fish come up. Looked at my bait, they'd either commit or they'd just kind of peel off. But so I, I repeated this process multiple times. I was like, man, this is this is frustrating. And this is just a good indicator. This isn't even a, a process I use to try and get a bite. I was just trying to get an indication of whether they would be willing to do this. But I had one follow it up. It was, I could tell it was a big one. Follows it up. I opened the bale. And I, after, after I had been fishing my bait, same way as always, I opened my bale, let it fall to the bottom. And even if it's the wrong bait, if they're willing to eat a bait off the bottom, they will follow it hard to the bottom and keep focus. If you can yeah. get them to follow it to the bottom and keep focus, that's like an indicator that <laughs> yeah. that's an indicator that he's gonna bite something off right, the bottom. Right. It's yeah, just absolutely. it may not be that specific bait. And so like I open the bail, follows it to the bottom, and luckily, like it was so on that he follows it to the bottom, I flip my bail, and I just jumps immediately. I step back, five ten. And I'm like, mm. you know, over five and a half pounder. And I was like, you know what? Next time I see a big one, if it does this again, I'm going to make an adjustment. Yeah. Sure enough, I come around uh, to another pocket set up the exact same way. I see two good ones. One's probably three and change. Another one I can tell is big. One. So I pitch out there and I'm specifically trying to pull the big one off the little one. So I pull the big one away from the little, littler one. And he comes up, looks at my Demiki, lose interest. I'm like, gosh, pick up my drop shot. Pitch a drop shot at him. He follows it, loses interest. I'm like, okay. So it legit has to be on the bottom. Pitch my Demiki at him again. Fish it over his head. He follows it up. Open the bail. Repeat the process. Open the bail. He follows it to the bottom. I see him on the screen. I see him turn and go back flat. And if you if you see him turn and go back flat, it's an indication that something has happened. Either he's eaten it or he has just totally lost interest. So right when I saw that happen, flip my bail. I get it tight and my line is just swimming off. I step back, zzz, six and a half pounder, nice. and I was like, "Oh my gosh, you know this is this is it." It's, I, I, it's Nico time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so I, uh, I caught a 
couple other, you know, high two, three pounders that day. I was like, and I, I was like, next time I rigged up a Nico. I was like, next time I see a big one, I'm going to, I'm going to pitch it at sea, but I never saw another big one the rest of the day on day one. So day two, I go out, I catch one early one on Demiki suspended. And then I switch to Nico because I, I see three on a pile through the Demiki over them. They wouldn't follow it. And they wouldn't follow it for very long. They'd follow a little bit, and not, not chase it all the way out. So I switched to Nico, throw it up there. First fish I throw it at. All three of them fall at the bottom. Three and a half pounds. Mm. I'm like, okay. And every single fish over three pounds for the rest of the tournament that I saw, I caught on that Nico. Like cool. every single one over three I saw, I caught. And uh, that that bait's unbelievable. When they were wanting to follow a bait up but eat it down, that Nico covers such a wide range of, of fish behaviors because it looks right up, it looks right on the bottom, and it writes itself on the bottom every time you pull it And in relation to like a shaky head where once it falls over, you're kind of screwed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Great, great information there, Drew, man. Um, just overall, appreciate you sharing all this insight with your experience. You know, Jody White and I are pretty good friends and, and we talk a lot about just the uh, the trend of, of younger generation, you know, excelling in the sport of bass fishing, uh, whether it's due to technology or, or whatever, who, who cares? Right now, there's this movement, and you're a part of that movement of, of these younger anglers that are really dominating, which we have not seen that very much over the past 35, 45 years. Um, and it's so much, it's so interesting to follow. Great to talk to you about it. Um, do you have any final closing thoughts before we end up the interview to uh, just kind of leave with Bass Edge Nation before we, before we close, close out the show? <clears throat> oh, man. You know, Everybody talks about forward-facing sonar, and it's it's a topic that you know you know love it or hate it is a very large part of our industry now. And like Absolutely. everybody looks at these conversations and, and goes forward-facing sonar. It's it's changing the way I fish. I don't get to do cool stuff anymore. I got to go out and throw a Demiki <laughs> rig every day. Right, right. With forward-facing sonar, it's like I've said this multiple times, and I'm going to say it again just to really drive the point home. It's an information tool. It gives you access to the facts. And regardless of what those facts are, it gives you that information. It, it, it's up to you what you do with it. Yeah. But it gives you access to that information. So whatever you're doing with, with bass fishing, whether you're fishing the bank, fishing offshore, fishing, you know, <clears throat> just doing whatever you're doing, fishing fast, fishing slow, it's the ability to know. Why on earth would you not want to know? <laughs> yeah. Why would you want to hope or think when you can know? And like, Regardless of how you fish, where you live, it can improve the way you do what you do. It may not be the primary use or the primary means of how you do what you do, but it can improve what you do. So, like, the stigma around forward-facing sonar is that it's always going to change the way you fish. It doesn't change the way you fish. It just yeah. makes you better at it. Usually and, uh, you know, that's that's something I always advise people to do. If you have the technology and you have access to technology, use it. It'll make you better. Um it, it doesn't have to be everything you do, but it'll make you better. And uh, if you want to learn more about bass behavior, there is no better way to do it. Yeah, forward-facing sonar, the new trend. Drew, you broke it down so well for us. Congratulations on your big win at Rayburn. Get out there tomorrow. Make that knockout round on Santee. Mess, hopefully, hopefully we'll see you fishing. Uh, well, obviously, we'll see you fishing tomorrow, but on Friday, but hopefully we see you fishing Saturday as well. Man, no again, doubt, man. I appreciate you taking the time to be with us right here on Bass Edge Radio. Everybody else, we're going to say goodbye to Drew, but everybody else, stay tuned. We're going to kind of break down a few highlights from Drew, a few uh, things that we've learned throughout this episode of Bass Edge Radio. Man, it's been just a great time. Drew, take care. Best of luck, buddy. And, Thanks, dude. Uh, I really appreciate it. We'll be back right after the newest addition to the Basscat STS family is here. Introducing the Caracal STS, showcasing aggressive styling, paired with enhanced performance, and a continued dedication to raising the bar. Measuring in at 20 feet 2 inches with an ultra-wide 96-inch beam and rated for a 250 to 300 horsepower engine, the Caracal STS boasts agility and speed and is finished with premium features to satisfy any angler. Basscat Boats. Feel the rush. Nobody wants to run out of power when they're on the water. There is a better way. 
Introducing the Charge Marine Power Management Station from PowerPole that does the work of three devices, a traditional battery charger, a charge on the run, and an emergency start system. PowerPole Charge. All right, welcome back. Closing thoughts right here on Bass Edge Radio. For, the, for those old enough, I know uh, I kind of think about uh, Jerry Springer. Remember Jerry Springer? I, I, maybe he's still on TV. He had uh, closed it. Final thoughts. Jerry Springer had final thoughts, man. Well, here's my final thoughts. First, man, huge shout out to uh, Renotheus out of France bringing us an understanding of a lure brand. He is launching here in the United States Digital Squad Fishing. Remember to check that out. You can find the links down in the description below. But uh, you can also, for those folks that are that are um, just listening on podcast streaming, you can find that if you go to Amazon and just search Digital Squad Fishing, you will find it out there. We'll also send a link to the uh, distribution business that Renault has established here in the U.S. called Providence Angler. Um, so we'll send you know both of those links to the descriptions below. So uh, check those out, man. Really, really cool lures. And uh, thanks to Renault for coming in and letting us know about that. Wow. Thanks to Drew as well. Dude just gave up some goods on Four Facing Sonar. So many podcasts these days just talk so much about why they like it or don't like it, really wanted to concentrate this episode on how to be successful with it. Um, You know, if you want to go out there and dabble with it, Drew gave some huge, huge, huge tips on what to look for from, you know, identifying bass behavior, uh, identifying other fish, um, understanding the fundamentals, I think is the most critical thing. Step number one is can I throw into my four phase and sonar cone? Can I understand where my cone is looking? Can I understand how far of a cast I'm making? Is that fish 40, 50, 60, 80 feet out? And, you know, can I understand the cover that that fish is relating to? So a lot of important factors there that Drew really brought to light. And, and I thought we bounced each other off of that great with my experience with some of the forward facing things too. But obviously Drew's got this thing dialed in, man. He is uh, really uh, at the forefront. And, and it seems like, again, a lot of these young anglers are, I go back the elite series going on today. Uh, as we tape, it's day one at Toledo bend. Uh, they had a couple cameras on Christy and Hackney and, and uh, then a few cameras on some guys fishing out, you know, utilizing the forward-facing sonar, finding those patterns within the patterns to know that those fish were were out there. And man, it's you know, it's not winter time by any means. Water temps moving up uh, in temperature, fish are moving for sure. But there's a lot of fish being caught on forward-facing sonar even right now in the Elite Series on Toledo Bend. So go check that out as well. They're going to be at Lake Fork. Next week, they have back-to-back events, Events, excuse me. I think we're going to see some of the same things. Lake Fork's about three hours north, two, two to three hours north of Toledo Bend, so it's going to be a little bit cooler water temps. Uh, we are having a really nice warm front here in Texas for late February. It's uh, it's actually phenomenal. Beautiful, beautiful weather. So uh, it's uh, the MLF BBT, obviously Drew's fishing tomorrow, uh, his second day of competition. We hope that he can make the uh, knockout round there and fish on Saturday, but that will conclude on Sunday. So make sure you check that out. More traditional type fishing. Santee Cooper, a low lying reservoir. Uh, Drew talked, he even saw six of his fish. The six bites he got yesterday, he saw them bite from forward facing sonar. So, So that is still being utilized, but there is a lot more traditional ways that, that, you know, these Bass Pro Tour anglers are catching fish this week. Uh, I know Matt Becker, uh, Dylan Hayes, uh, utilizing some lipless crankbaits, which you saw a big part of, we talked about a little bit earlier, the Gunnersville uh, Toyota event, A-Rigs, lipless crankbaits. It was one on forward facing uh, out there, but a lot of guys did very, very well with those traditional pre-spawn techniques. Um, the Rayburn Toyota event. Finishing up on Saturday. Uh, as you watch this, it's probably closing up or it's already closed up. Uh, but uh, be sure you check out those standings. See what happened over there at the MLF Toyota event on Rayburn. I was surprised. 
attendance a little down in that event, about 150 anglers. So uh, interesting to see maybe how the economy is affecting some of the uh, travel, but it certainly didn't. As I mentioned previously at Lake Gunnersville, they had 260 pros, but that Southeast division is always just uh, through the roof. Be sure to tune back with Bass Edge, uh, our next episode. We are going to bring in our buddy Rich Lindgren, uh, Hella Bass. Uh, make sure you check out uh, Rich's Fantasy Fishing. He's got a cool thing going on over there at Bassmaster. Beat Hella Bass. You can join in with that. Make sure you check out his YouTube channels. Watch that stuff. But uh, we're going to have so much more to talk about with the BBT at Santee. And also, uh, obviously, talking about the um, uh, event there at Toledo Bend. And a little bit of precursor precursor to the Lake Fork event if we can jump on mid next week be sure to hit that subscribe button comment down below man it's great to see everybody here on bass edge radio we're gonna do it again in about two weeks we'll see you here y'all take care adios